Right. Let's let's get started. So the, the usual rules, everyone will be uh, muted until we uh, ask questions at the end. And um, uh, Tess will be monitoring any questions in the the Zoom chat function. So if anyone's got questions during the presentation, you can add them in there and uh, we'll be happy to answer them. And Elizabeth will be monitoring those as well. Um, this Zoom meetup, as usual, is being recorded. So for those of you who'd like to watch it again, who missed something, some detail from the presentation perhaps, because uh, Elizabeth will have a PowerPoint presentation, or for people who aren't able to join today, uh, they'll be able to see it. It'll be on our website. There'll be a link sent out showing you how to watch the recording at a, at a different time. Um, so tonight, we're very uh, lucky to have yet again Elizabeth Barnes, um, our elite racer and um, in much demand coach. Uh, she coaches people all over the world to compete in, uh, win, and also finish stage races around the world. She's going to be talking to us tonight about nutrition, which is perhaps one of the most important topics uh, which you need to look at for the success of your race. We find that year after year, uh, invariably nutrition is the single reason why people fail to finish. Uh, usually find by you know, the second or third day, people are having problems being able to eat their food. And of course, once you are unable to consume calories, then that's pretty much the end of your race. Um, and despite being advised year after year on the type of food they're supposed to take to bring, um, having tried out the food in um, difficult conditions prior to the race, a lot of people make the same mistake. So hopefully those of you tonight will benefit from Elizabeth's experience and not make some of the simplest mistakes there are, because there's a lot of things for people to do right and to do wrong when it comes to nutrition. So we'll, we'll be handing over to Elizabeth in a, in a minute. Um, we're also very pleased this evening to have uh, Fleur Cushman here. She's the CEO and founder of Currents, which is a New Zealand product. Um, it's something we just came across several months ago, and Currents were very keen to sponsor the Grand to Grand Ultra this year. Um, once we got to know Fleur and her brother, Scott, uh, we could see that they were very passionate about their product, which has actually been on the go for many years and has benefited from lots of uh, studies, clinical studies, which have proved the uh, efficacy of current. So I've asked uh, Fleur to see if she would talk for a few minutes at the end of the presentation and let you know a little bit about why Currents is a great product and why it's brilliant for recovery of um, ultra runners. So I'll, I won't steal any of her th thunder. I'll let her talk at the end. So thank you for joining us tonight, Fleur. Um, right, Elizabeth, can I hand over to you now? Um, and I'm, oh, Before I say that, I'd like to say that Tess has joined us tonight. We had a bit of an emergency with our canine companions, but fortunately she's back from the vet now. So Tess, you might like to say hello. Hi, hello everyone, and um, good to see um, <clears throat> a few repeat um, attendees and some people that I haven't seen for a while. So welcome. Um, just um, a warning, um, my my doggy is actually under my desk right now and she's not 100%. She had a she was given a, a booster rabies shot. And for some reason, I think she's having a bit of a reaction. So hopefully she'll be fine. But um, I may have to excuse myself if if I need to um, to take care of her. Okay, thank you, Tess. Um, okay, let's hand over to Elizabeth and uh, take it from here, Elizabeth. Thank you. Thank you, Colin. I'm going to share my screen. Here we go. Okay, race food. So I'm going to get into what we're going to talk about today, just briefly for the benefit of those who 
may not have seen me before. I am an ultra running coach. I am an ultra runner, started running ultra marathons in 2011, but I have run since the, well, I don't know, a long time. My first marathon was in 2002. I'm also a life coach, PhD student, and I have a bit of a nomadic lifestyle, but a house in Norway, and that's where I am right now. Um, I'm not running competitively anymore. I'm more focused on coaching, but here are some of the things I've done. So I'm probably most known for having won the Marathon de Sable twice. And I did the Grand to Grand in 2016. And here are a few snapshots of that experience. Um, it was uh, it was really great fun and it's a lovely lovely race and a lovely sized race I think so quite different from from some of the bigger ones okay so without further ado um I'm just going to uh, give you some general overall tips to begin with and we're just going to recap the rules of the food for ground to ground then I will talk about um the bigger picture how do you structure your race food for this week and when we've done that, we're going to drill down and we're going to look at how do you structure your food for a day. Then we're going to look at what are foods that are suitable versus not suitable. Um, some tips for hydration. And then if we have time, we look at how you can pack, label and organize your food. I'm afraid I'll probably try to squeeze too much into this presentation as usual, <laughs> but I will try to um to cover everything um i can i can see you know i can talk for hours about this right so we will not be able to get into all of the detail but what i want to leave you with is you know a, a greater understanding for what is important and some tools for uh, actually going off and creating your own food plan um no matter what type of food you eat right so that doesn't matter you know if you're a vegetarian or vegan or gluten-free or you know it doesn't matter we, we don't go into that level of detail um, in this presentation okay um so food ro rules in the ground to ground and feel free to chip in of course tess and colin um so fourteen thousand calories minimum 2000 calories per day. There's also a minimum weight that applies and that is available on the website. So I'm not listing that here. Um, and you need to provide a summary listing of your food uh, during the race check-in. And then there is hot water available in camp for cooking in the morning and in the evening. So that's actually really good because it means you don't have to worry about taking a stove and the fuel and, and all of that hassle. So you can eat hot food and do that in a convenient way. Is there anything that you want to add to this, Colin? No, that's that's fine. That's a that's a good overview. Thank you. Okay, so general tips. Okay. Um so so when you do a, a race like this, you know, you do long distances every day, many hours on your feet, it's hot, you're adding to your body weight by carrying a backpack. Um, you could easily expand 500 to 1,000 calories per hour just walking in this environment. Your energy requirements uh, will probably exceed 7,000 calories per day. And why am I saying that? I'm saying that because there's no point. I could I could sit here and, and talk you through how you can calculate your energy expenditure, right? And we could spend half an hour on that. There's no point. Uh, the conclusion is you will be in a calorie deficit. Um, and that's all you need to know, right? And you cannot carry enough food to compensate for that. You cannot be in, in energy balance here. So that is just a fact to accept. Um, it doesn't mean that you will necessarily be hungry. Actually, a lot of people struggle to, to eat their food um, after a couple of days. Um, so, so that is not necessarily a, a problem. 
um, actually a lot of people pack too much food for for what they can realistically eat. But that being said, fueling is super, super important. One uh, key success factor for multi-stage racing is recovery. And you recover by eating and sleeping. Um, And so for that reason, it is important to have a well thought through um, nutrition plan for the race. So you want to be able to get as much, let's say, energy in as you can realistically carry given the weight limitations you have. And you also want to consider the quality of your food and also the macronutrient uh, composition of that food. Um, And we will talk a little bit more about it, but I uh, think that you should prioritize protein and carbohydrates over fat. So we'll get into that a little bit more. Um, And then you should also think about the practicality of foods. So can you easily eat your intended snacks on the move? And that depends a little bit on who you are uh, as a competitor. So whether you are top runner, mid pack, um, or perhaps a walker. Um, so that is something that I will get into a little bit more as well. Okay. So uh, I saw that we have a question in the chat. So I don't know if you want to answer that straight away, Colin because that was a question for you. Oops. It's a little bit random for me whether I see the chat or not, apparently. So right now I can't see the question. Let's leave it till the end for the the questions. Yeah. 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 Um, Okay. So structure the food for the week. So now uh, I've shown you this before, those of you who have seen my previous presentations. Um, This is just a a recap. Uh, Bearing in mind the race structure, I think is important when you plan your food. So I'm gonna show you, uh, I'm gonna show you why, but this is how it might look uh, for a walker because you basically don't get the full rest day as a walker you split the long stage so you you will be moving pretty much every day um but here uh, when we talk about distributing your calories over the week what are some things you might want to think about so sort of all of these boxes i will go through them one by one we start with day one 50 kilometers what do you want to do? Well, you want you want to be off to a good start, right? You want to keep energy levels up. You want to recover for the next day. You want to make sure that you stay well hydrated. And one consideration for day one is that you don't actually carry the breakfast, so you can afford, uh, you know, a generous, generously sized breakfast for day one. And there is effectively no weight limitation on that breakfast as long as you manage to keep your pack size within the overall weight limitation. Um, day two, um, day two is important because you have the long stage on day three, right? So you definitely want to make sure you get enough food inside you on day two. And on stage three, which is the long day, you want to make sure that you have enough to last the duration of that race. And one thing that can happen when you are on the move for a long time and also in this um, type of environment where, you know, it's it's hot, um, is that you might get uh, some gastrointestinal problems. So you want to avoid or minimize uh, that. Uh, what can also happen during a long stage like this um, is that your taste buds might change throughout the stage. So uh, you might find that you crave different things in the second half or during the night or something like that. So that's something to think about here. And once this stage is done, uh, which for some will go into the rest day, 
um, it's really, really important then that you recover from this stage and you recharge because you still have three more days, right? So sometimes people go, oh yeah, but it's a rest day. I'm just going to lay down with my feet in the air. I don't need to eat very much. I just go for, you know, the minimum calories. I think that's a bad idea, right? Um, because you are coming in extremely depleted from the long stage. So this is not a day to, to skimp on calories. And then... Uh, the day after that, yeah, you, it's just a, it's just like a regular day, right? You just need to keep replenishing uh, to make it to the end. And when you have done day six, um, you need to have 2,000 calories left or 500 grams left at the end of this stage. But there is actually no, uh, then no specific requirement for the the final day, but you need to make sure that, you know, you, you have still met the, the total. And of course you do need to eat something for day seven. It's not uh, long, but it's actually uh, quite a challenging day anyway, after everything you've done um, and you're going uphill. So that's a bit of the high level of the week. So I'm going to show you here what the sample distribution of 19,000 calories might look like. And I have assumed that these 19,000 calories weigh in the region of 4.75 kilograms. Um, and uh, when I did uh, the grant to grant in 2016, I had about um, 18,500 calories. So this is actually not far off from um, my own uh, plan. So, um, day one has a bit more because it's a long day and it's um, it's the breakfast that you don't have to carry, so you can have some more breakfast. Um, and then day two. Is kind of my base. My, so let's say that my baseline calories is like two thousand six hundred for for a stage race. Like I usually end up somewhere somewhere around there, and that seems to work for me, right? So this is this is an example. It does. I don't say this will work for you, right? Everybody needs to come to their own uh, conclusions. Um, but so this is more or less what I what I know will approximately work for me. And so it might work for somebody who is sort of similar to me. Um, on day three, uh, typically I would add on about a thousand calories for a long stage compared to what I would take on a shorter, let's say, regular stage. So that goes for pretty much all stage races I've done. I just put on another thousand calories for the long stage. So in this example, I I put in. 3,800 calories. And what you can see here is that when we get to the end of day three, that's pretty much 50% of the calories already. And I like to, uh, let's say, front load the calories. And the reason for that is that the food is something that, well, yeah, it's important to keep you going. And I think if you get enough energy inside you in early in the race, um, you have a greater chance of carrying on strong. The other reason is that the food is the only thing in your backpack that will reduce in weight. So the more you eat earlier, the less your pack will weigh, right? Later in the, later in the race. So there is no point for example, saving something fantastic for day seven, you know, and carrying that around the whole week, like, because that's not going to add to your performance. So always think about, is this going to add to my performance? Um, okay, yes or no, right? Um, day four, put it back on kind of the sort of baseline calories as well as day five. Um, slightly less on, on day six, um, if this would have been, if this would have been the, the marathon de sable, I would probably have reduced that day six down to two thousand calories. But I think you need a bit more in grant to grant 
Um, it's longer, it's harder, the days are longer, you're at altitude. Um, so overall, you need a bit more calories, I think. Um, and then day seven, uh, 2000 calories, which in theory, I guess could be slightly less. Um, but, but I guess the bottom line is uh, we split the calories according to the, the days and what is required by the days, uh, but also front loading the calories a bit. Um, so we have more calories earlier in the week. Um, and I will also argue that um, not many people will manage on minimum calories. 2000 calories per day is very little. Um, and for some, it will be fine. For most people, it won't. And if you're not used to, let's say, spreadsheets, if calories is something very foreign to you, uh, don't worry about that. But you can take the approach of just laying the food out that you're intending to take. Just lay it out. Look at it. You know, does this look like something that will sustain me for a day? Um, or um, download um, just um, one of these um, food counting, calorie counting apps and just record in what you eat during a few days in normal life. And, and you get an idea of, you know, what, what you might eat during training, etc. And and maybe you, you get familiar with what what calories are in relation to, you know, the food that you Okay, so um, just uh, just checking the chat to see. I assume the nineteen thousand calories includes food consumed whilst running, not just breakfast and dinners. Yeah, it's everything. It's everything. Um, so I'll show you soon what that uh, looks like. Um, the lack of food often scares runners at their first experience in multi stage race, but at the end of the race, they discover that it isn't a problem. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, so taking too much food is a common problem. Okay, how much should your food weigh? Um, so I think the food will weigh in the region of four to six kilos, and the minimum weight of the food is 3.5 kilos in the table on the website. Um, just to give you an idea, and and here I also had this slide, I think, in the kit presentation. So I'll show that to you again. You can see that the food is actually quite a substantial part uh, of your total equipment uh, weight. So here are a couple of examples of what it might look like. Um, and I will argue, and I said this before, if your food weighs less than 50% of your backpack, you have probably too much other equipment but that's not the topic of this presentation, but just be prepared. The food will take up a lot of volume in your pack and a lot of weight. And that's as it should be, you know, because you need it. And every day it's going to reduce in weight. So that's the benefit of that. Okay, so we looked at the week. So let's go and look at a day. First, I'm just going to show you this. I also showed you that in the... Uh, presentation on training, I believe it was. So I just, I just want to recap this. Um, so if you're a top runner, you will probably take five to six hours for uh, uh, any of the normal stages, 11 to 16 hours for the long stage. If you're somewhere in the middle, um, you're gonna take seven and a half to nine hours for a regular stage and 19 to 25 hours for the long stage. And uh, these are just stats from the previous results. So. <laughs> and if you're a walker, you're gonna take 10 to 11 hours for a regular stage and 27 to 32 hours for the long stage. Then you're gonna be um, well into the rest day uh, when you finish. So with that in mind, I'll just put that in a, in a slightly different view here, what happens during a day, um, because this is relevant for your food, as you will see. So um, Colin informed me that you will get hot water from about 6 a.m. 
for an 8 a.m. start, so that's plenty of time to have your breakfast. I actually recommend having breakfast the first thing you do when you get up, um, but I appreciate that, that people might have different habits, and, and that's fine. Um, but it can be practical to have it uh, one out of the way, and then you focus on the other parts of getting ready, but also uh, just to be able to digest it a bit. And then we have the actual uh, race. So this is a, uh, on the assumption of, of a, a normal stage. So of course, if you're a top runner, you will then finish early afternoon and you have quite a few hours um, to just rest, eat something, you know, do some foot care. So what does that mean? Well, it probably means that you almost want a lunch and you want at least to have a recovery shake and a snack before you have your dinner because it's going to be way too early to have dinner when you finish. Um, for the mid-pack competitor, well, you're going to finish late afternoon. So um, you probably want to have a recovery shake or something and then it's a couple of hours before you have your dinner. Um, for the walker, it's basically just you walk, you cross the finish line, and you don't actually have a lot of time. You're going to go have your dinner. So just have your dinner, and then you go to bed, pretty much. I think that's it. So it can be really, really good, if you don't know already, to try to figure out who am I? Where will I end up? because that's gonna help you to structure your food. And so you can go onto the website, you can look at previous results, you can connect with other people um, and, and just try to figure this out. If you have no idea where to begin, you can talk to me, I, I will help you. Um, but yeah, definitely do that. So let's look at if we have 2000 calories for a day. Uh, as, a, as an example, like how could that be distributed? Um, well, I think if you're a top runner, you're going to have your breakfast, then, and I just put the breakfast at 500 calories, right? Some people might want more breakfast. Some people might really struggle with having breakfast. So this will differ. Um, and then for five to six hours of running, I put in 800 calories. Um, which might not seem like a lot, but it's it's uh, I, I argue it's enough. Um, and uh, one thing to bear in mind here, like I said before, is that you you carry all your food. Um, if you look at like sports nutrition guidelines, for example. Uh, you know, they might say, oh, but yeah, you should consume 90 grams of carbohydrates per hour, for example. Um, yeah, that's all well and good. You know, if you have a crew or if you're in a lab or something, but when you're in a self-sufficient race in the desert, you can't do that um, because you simply cannot carry all of those calories. So I think it's more reasonable to look at something um, maybe like 100 and 50 calories per hour, something like that. Uh, then you finish, you have some kind of recovery shake, uh, protein, carbohydrates, and you probably want to have a lunch uh, snack, like a very light snack, p uh, afternoon snack, and then dinner. Uh, for the meat packer that comes in a bit later, what we're gonna do is we're gonna shift calories from the afternoon snack into the run uh, stage. Uh, fueling um, but the recovery shake is still is still there um, and for the walker the walker uh, will be out on the course when the other people have their recovery shakes and snacks in camp so for the walker the focus is okay it's, it's like we split it into three things we split it into breakfast then we have the snacks for the walking and then we have dinner once in camp, right? So that's how it looks a little bit different. And another thing that is different is what is practical to take in depending on your speed. So if you are a walker, it, you might say, yeah, it's fine for me. I can walk into a bar. That's great. 
um, I can't run and chew a bar. Uh, it, it doesn't work. Um, but if I did want to eat one, I could maybe do it while I was walking up a climb or something. But as a fast runner, I find it more practical to have foods that kind of just melt in the mouth. Um, and, and so also think about those things. What do you think is going to work for you based on what you like, based on your speed? Um, try things in training, figure this out. Um, so tips for daily distribution of calories. Yeah, I said, look at the pathways results um, and estimate your realistic finishing time or range. Um, and then uh, what you can do is if you, if you don't really know, um, you can try to make your plan a bit flexible. So for example, freeze dried meals, uh, if that's what you're going to have for dinner, they often come in different sizes, like 1,000 calories, 800, 600, 400, 450, things like that. Um, which, by the way, you can also repackage. So you're you're actually not bound to the calories in a pack. If you repackage it, you have full flexibility. But let's say you're thinking of having 800 calories for dinner. That seems like a good amount for you. Okay, so instead of having one big 800-calorie meal, you can reduce that. You, you can say, okay, I'm going to have the meal of 500 or 600 calories and I'm going to have one or two snacks and together it's going to make up 800 calories but then if I take longer in the stage and need to eat more food while I'm out walking or running I can dig into those snacks right it, because that's much easier than starting to to snack from your freeze-dried meal bag right that's not gonna work so that's a way of, of making your food plan flexible. Um, so what else? Think about if it's easier for you to eat in the evening or the morning. Um, I was helping somebody who really, really struggles to eat in the morning, but we did agree that it's, it's important to get something inside you before a long stage like this. Um, and so that person ended up with... Um, a liquid breakfast and a meal replacement shake, which was uh, oat-based and nutritionally balanced. And that worked uh, really, really well. Um, and um, actually research as well uh, points to that. It can be um, uh, easier to have a liquid breakfast, like more, more gentle on the, on the stomach. So that's a consideration. And some people love their breakfast. I love my breakfast. I have no problem eating in the morning. Um, but we're all different, right? Um, think about how much fuel you take in when you train or if you do any other races that are a bit longer. Um, it's important to practice in training. Uh, it's important to know like what you need to sustain yourself, but as you get closer to the race, you can also train your gut for the race. So the closer to the race you get, the more you should practice with your actual uh, race fuel to make sure that you uh, that you tolerate it. Um, and also think about what has worked for you in the past. But right? you should never try anything new in a race. Um, and uh, a lot of people will probably have ideas and advice, me included, right? <laughs> but make sure you just, uh, you know, uh, approach it, you know, with a with a critical uh, critical eye and and make sure that it's going to work for you. You know, pass it through your own filter. Okay, I now have this information. What will work for me? What will not work for me? Right? If you're unsure, you try it. Um, and I mentioned this with a, um, you know. 90 grams of carbs per hour already, but you can see there, yeah, that's 2,900 calories for eight hour, hours. You're not gonna be able to, to carry that. So it's not practical, right? Um, right. Okay, so I'm going to exemplify here the long stage, um, what that might look like, because that is of course different from uh, a regular stage. Um, so breakfast, 
Um, I think if if you know if it's easy for you to eat breakfast, you should probably have a bit more breakfast for the long stage. Um, also, those who are the fastest, if you know you're going to be the fastest, um, you will probably start a couple of hours later on the long day. So maybe it's 10 a.m. instead of 8 a.m., and which will also allow you to eat a bit more or to maybe have a small snack before starting. Um, the run-walk fueling will then be, uh, for most people, will, will be m most of the food for this stage. So that's important to think about. So um, what I normally do is, for a long stage, I have, I take first my, my running snacks for a regular stage. And I look at that as, that is portion one for my long stage. It's like part one. And then I double it and I create a part two. So I have two sets of, of running snacks for moving through the long stage. But my second set has more savory foods. It has a bit more protein. It has a bit more fat. The first set is almost exclusively carbohydrates, but I can't keep running for this amount of time on only sugar. Like I start to crave other things. So I might have crushed crisps. I might have a, a meal replacement shake that, that I can have as a more substantial refueling thing midway through. Um, so I might have some salted nuts. It's going to involve yeah, something more savory because I know that that's what I will crave when I've been out for say eight plus uh, hours. Um, and the faster runners will, uh, will be able to get back and have some sort of dinner. It's gonna be a late dinner, but, but it is a dinner. Um, and if you're a mid packer, it's going to be, let's say, early morning uh, when you get in. Um, and I, uh, and and I really, I, I I must say this: it doesn't matter when you get in. Before you go to sleep, you eat something. Right? And if you think you can't eat a meal, then mix up a shake. But I plan to have something before you sleep, no matter when you get in. And maybe that is your next morning breakfast. Um, but but have it because you you will need to recover. You will be very depleted. Um, and for the walkers, the walkers will will effectively then need to think about the rest day as also being part of the long stage. So so some of your food for the rest day should incorporate these snacks that you can eat on the go. And then the rest of the rest day, you know, you know, you get to having camp and a proper dinner and that. But it's important to to think about how long this is going to take. Maybe if I can just jump in here for a second, Elizabeth, and yes. um, let people know that at checkpoints six, seven, and eight on the long stage, we actually have hot water. So normally the hot water would only be available at camp, but for the benefit of people typically in the mid-pack or at, or at the walkers, they can actually rehydrate their meals with hot water at checkpoints six, seven, and eight. So they don't need to wait all the way to camp to do that, which is important because, you know, they'll be dipping into their second day worth of food and they'll need to have, you know, a dinner late at night out on the course and then breakfast the next morning as well. Yeah, so that's great. So so uh, how many checkpoints are there on the long stage? So it so there are eight there are eight checkpoints and checkpoint six is the first one that we actually have hot water at. Mm -hmm. So there'll be check the checkpoints six, seven, and eight have hot water as well as hot water at the camp when they arrive. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Yeah, that's really good. I actually meant to ask you about that because it means that you can bring a meal and you can rehydrate it on the go. Um and it can be a really good morale boost to have a hot meal when you're out for so many hours. Uh, so the only thing you need to make sure is that you have the time, right? So if if um, if there is a risk that you might miss, you know, cutouts if you stop, then what you can do is you can actually uh, rehydrate your meal and then you just keep going. And then after like 20 minutes, you know, you can just eat it a bit on the go. That's also possible to do that. Um, and so if you decide to do that, I'm going to talk a little bit about the packaging, but if you decide to do that, you probably want to have at least that meal 
in the original food bag that it comes in. You don't want to have that repackaged because you want it to be really quick and practical to eat. And that's from the bag. Okay. Um, uh, okay. Um, broth after midnight. Leanne says broth, broth after midnight, extra sodium and warm. Yes, that can absolutely be, be good. And somebody else said to not try anything new in the race. Yes, absolutely. Okay. So let's move on. Um, okay, so I think I already mentioned uh, most of these uh, things, but I think um, a variety is really important. Um, if you have leftover snacks, you can have them the next day. Um, and uh, yeah, something to have easily for breakfast on the move and always eat something when you finish. Yeah, so we covered all of this already. I'm gonna move on in the interest of time. Um, and yes, flexible, flexible. Um, I think flexible meal plan for the rest day is good, right? So the rest day, the rest day shouldn't be, okay, freeze dried meal for breakfast, freeze dried meal for lunch, freeze dried meal for dinner. Right, because it's a very inflexible plan. Even if you can heat a meal on the go, like it's, you know, it's it's impractical to have to rely on that. And a lot of things can go wrong in a state race. So you might have a plan A, and your plan A might be that you're going to be like a fast mid packer, but something can happen, and you end up walking the long stage, and it end up ends up taking you fifty percent longer than you thought, um, or even double. Like that can happen. So I encourage everybody to just think about that a little bit, build a little bit of contingency into your plan, and then you won't be caught out, right? And then the rest day as well, yes, eat, um, recharge and recover because you still have three days to go. Uh, and in the rest day, we use to refill energy with gelato or Coke. Yeah, I'll, um, I'll let uh, Colin make those promises. <laughs> um, okay. Um, suitable foods. I'm going to start with unsuitable foods. Um, and this should be pretty obvious, but unfortunately, I don't think it is for everybody. So I, I just want to make sure that everybody's aware. Do not take any canned food. It's heavy. Do not take any wet ration packs. They are heavy. Um, most gels are not good. So can you take gels? Yes, you can take gels, but you should be aware that you are carrying water if you do. Um, and there are some gels that are a bit more concentrated, so they would be um, maybe better. But I would say that gels are a luxury. I would say like you feel like you have to have gels or maybe one is one gel a stage it's like your kind of pick me up snack um it's better to train without gels and not rely on them chocolate coated snacks can melt in the heat um some some seem to work but you make sure you have tested that or it can get really messy um any ready mixed drinks like bottled drinks of course is lots of water and any fresh perishable food um, is not going to work either. Uh, so what will work? Free dried meals. Um, and some people are say like, oh, free dried meals, oh, they are no good, blah, blah. Freeze, freeze drying is actually a very good way of, of preserving food. And there are some brands out there that do very nutritious, excellently cooked freeze dried meals. So uh, you can definitely find that. Um, other dry meals from the supermarket. There are dried soups, uh, noodles, mashed potato, couscous, um, oats, um, cereal bars, uh, lots of things that uh, can work. Um, dry snacks. So go to the supermarket, go to the snack shelf and have a look at what's there. Crisps, nuts, uh, roasted, roasted beans, pretzels, crackers, um, various things. Um, you can have dried meats. Um, so the little mini mini sausages, jerky, biltong, 
um, pepperoni, things like that. Dried or freeze-dried fruit. Freeze-dried fruit is a quite nice crunchy snack. It doesn't need to be rehydrated. You just eat it as it is. Um, and it's very lightweight, um, but also dried uh, food, uh, fruits um, can be good. And then there are a number of powdered drinks. So I mentioned before meal replacement shakes. Uh, they typically have um, like a balanced sort of uh, macronutrient profile of, of fat, carbohydrates and protein. So they, uh, they can replace a meal, uh, which can be suitable for breakfast or, or on the go. Um, recovery shakes with um, carbohydrate and protein. So typically we would look at the three to one or four to one ratio of carbohydrates to protein for those. Um, you might want to have a carbohydrate energy powder uh, in one of your bottles uh, when you run. Um, freeze dried smoothies and juices. And there are uh, dried milk powder and also plant milk powders. So lots of things there. Um, jelly type sweets are really good. Also again, just regular sweets in the supermarket, nothing fancy. Most of them are made of glucose or glucose syrup. Um, which is kind to the stomach and, you know, goes straight out in your bloodstream. So that's good energy and they are easy to portion out because they are already portioned, you know, small, small snacks. So like jelly babies, for example, and, and there are vegan options as well. Um, you can have energy bars, uh, if you think that works, um, for you either as a snack or during walking or running. And there are, of course, a multitude of sports nutrition chews and, and snacks. And the only thing I will say about that is try it in training because you have to make sure you tolerate the ingredients. Um, sometimes there are like different carbohydrates added that are not well to uh, tolerated by, by everybody um, or sugar replacements that can cause gas and bloating. So you have to, you have to try these things. Don't take anything you haven't tried in, in training. And also nut butter portion packs are quite good. Um, can be nice to have in a cracker or something. Um, high, high energy and a nice addition. And, you know, if, if anybody has done this race or other stage races already, I mean, I think just pop in the chat if you had something I haven't mentioned that really worked for you and then other people can see it and and uh, and get some ideas uh, because this is not meant to be an exhaustive list of of everything um so a sample macronutrient distribution so macronutrients uh, are fat protein and carbohydrates um you are running or walking you're expanding a lot of energy and you then need to recover. Your body uses carbohydrates and protein. Um, so it can be tempting to, um, when you start to plan your food, to look at calories per gram. And you go, oh, I, I see that this food has really a lot of calories in it. Yes, but that then is probably very high in fat. And so if you just look at calories per 100 gram, you risk ending up with a very fat heavy diet. Um, but you already have a lot of, uh, all of us, it doesn't matter how thin you are, you have fat, enough fat on your body, right? That is not the, the primary source of, of, of calories that you need. Um, so I really encourage you, unless you have a particular diet for whatever reason, it's fine, stick with that. But otherwise, I would say you should have a substantial amount of your calories from carbohydrates, which will allow you to, to run and recover. Um, same with the, the protein. So maybe you want to aim for uh, one to one and a half uh, grams of protein per kilo body weight per day. Um, put that in your food plan. And then and maybe you want to have three, four hundred grams of carbohydrates per day. And then the rest can come from fat. But you know, don't, don't think about the fat first. That's my opinion. Okay, um, swiftly moving on. This is a bit of a whistle-stop tour. So hydration 
Um, and we, we could do a whole talk on hydration, right? We're not doing that, but I want to give you just a few pointers. Um, you should acclimatize to the heat. We talked about that in the training talk. Um, so you can go back to that to refresh if you need to, but that is really, really important. And that is going to help you digest your food. It's going to help um, help your hydration. It's going to, to just really help you to not get ill in the race and to keep your food down. Um, so definitely do it. Um, carbohydrate drinks. Uh, first, I encourage you to have one uh, bottle of plain water always, all the time. And then you could have a bottle with a carbohydrate drink if you want. But think about that as something that is aiding your hydration. Don't think about it as something that is providing you a lot of calories, because if you do, you risk mixing that too concentrated and you're actually not going to hydrate from it. Um, and it can cause you stomach issues. So you want to keep that concentration quite low, actually, maybe around 4%, absolutely max 8%. Um, so don't be tempted to make a really concentrated carbohydrate drink thinking that that is going to help with your fueling. Um, rather look at solid foods for your fueling. And then uh, calculate your electrolyte needs, right? So um, I, I think too often people just guess when it comes to electrolytes and, and replacing sodium and you buy these, maybe you buy some capsules and you go, yeah, I'm just going to take a capsule an hour. And then that capsule maybe has 250 milligrams of sodium. And in fact, that could be like much, much less than you need. And so, um, so how do you know how much you need? Well, I mean, it is possible to test it if that is available to you. Um, so then you can do that. Um, what you can do is you can definitely test how much you uh, sweat out, your volume. So that can be helpful. And then uh, when you train and you sweat, you can look at your clothes and you can see, do I have white marks? Does it look like a lot of salt is coming out? Can give you an, an idea, right? Um, but this is something to, to think about and, and try to read up on this and figure this out. Um, because I think a lot of people take to too little with them. Um, and the, actually <clears throat> having, you know, uh, some extra salt to salt your food can be good. Uh, maybe having a broth cube uh, to add to your food or to drink separately, things like that. Um, but this is also something to think about. And the body is quite clever. So if salt tastes good, then chances are you need it, right? Um, and... The final bit here, packaging your food, right? So when it comes to packaging your food, if we first look at your meals, um, whatever meals you, you plan on taking, um, you can have your meal in an original packaging, um, which is practical, but often heavy. Um, if you have freeze dried meals in each pouch, you have a little pouch inside uh, that is there to keep the food fresh. And that weighs uh, a fair amount, as does the packaging. You can repackage it into regular food, food and freezer bags, or you can vacuum pack uh, your meals. If you repackage, you have full flexibility of how many calories you want the meal to contain. You're not restricted to the original meal size, right? Let's say you have a meal of 1,000 calories, but you want to take 700, then you leave 300 behind. So it can be good to invest in a in a kitchen scales uh, for this place and um, and weigh up your your food. So this is what it looks like uh, when you vacuum pack uh, your food. So this is actually my food for the Grand to Grand in 2016. And you can see it here. This is what it looks like laid out. Um, all of my breakfast, my race snacks, powders, uh, recovery dinners. Um, and you can see that, yeah, it's it's actually, you know, it's a fair amount. And all of that is going into your backpack. So you can see how trying to reduce the volume as well as the weight of your food is quite important because it means you can actually take more food and uh, less packaging. <laughs> and uh, you can see there are actually a couple of a couple of little gels there as well. There is some luxury. 
Um, and here you can see how then um, these um, these food packs go into day rations. So this is also really important to structure food into day rations so that you're organized. Every day you know what you're having. And when you look at, if you look here at the left side, we have the IKEA Ziploc bags. They are great, by the way, very uh, durable. Um, you can see that that food has just been repackaged into regular plastic uh, food bags. Um, whereas on the right hand side, we have the vacuum packed uh, food. I think it's a matter of preference uh, what you what you do. Um, um, so tips if you repackage your food. Your bags should be of good quality. If you re if you repackage freeze dried meals, the freeze dried food can be really sharp and can stick holes in the bags. So you, you want to have good quality bags, um, and do practice it first a bit. I mean, you can always redo it if it doesn't work. But some people create like hard tennis balls, uh, which can be really bad for your back when you carry the packs. You definitely want to make your packs as flat as possible. Um, and you can pack your snacks into small Ziploc bags that can be quite um, practical. Um, and then you can label your, your food bags um, if required. I mean, maybe that is something that Colin can mention afterwards, you know, what level of detail you need to go to um, here. But definitely mark up your, your days, uh, if nothing else, for yourself so that you know uh, which day is for what. Um, and finally, just eating the food. Um, if you don't use the original packaging, you need to eat your food from something, right? So you need to bring a lightweight pot or a bowl. So just try to find something that is really light and keep it clean. Super important. You don't want to have any bugs in there. And use a long handled spoon. So you can go back and see my uh, equipment talk. I might have mentioned that. I'm not sure, but yeah, I recommend a long handled spoon. You don't want fingers in your food. Um, and if you vacuum pack your race stage snacks, which I have done, you need to make sure that you actually can open the packs. So uh, it can be more practical to have Ziplocs for that. But if you vacuum pack, you just have to have uh, small scissors or knife to hand so you can actually open those packs when you're running. Um, and like I said, yeah, consider leaving one drink bottle for water only, always. Um, you, you never know when you want to just squirt some water over you. And it's not so nice to do that with the sports drink. It gets a bit messy. Um, okay, somebody asks if it's possible to have vacuum packing in Canab. You know, I, I think this is something that you basically... Uh, you don't even if it like that was possible. You probably don't want to leave it that late. What you want to do is uh, you just buy a a cheap vacuum packer off Amazon and you do it at home. I would say that's probably the way to go. Like don't rely on being able to do this anywhere uh, else just before the race. Um, I know some people before who maybe knew somebody who had a restaurant and could do it in in their kitchen things like that. So. That could be an option. Um, okay, so I think we have, yes, yeah, so we have come to the end of this now. Phew. <laughs> um, so that was a lot packed into a short space of time. Um, I hope it was, you know, helpful. You can watch it back. You have the information on the slides. If you want more help, um, I do offer coaching for the race, even though we're getting quite close now, but I do also one-to-one -one consultations on Zoom, which you can you know, use for whatever you want. So I often do help people with you know, talking through the training or talking through their equipment or talking through their food. And I can also do a full personalized race food plan if you feel like this was totally overwhelming, you don't want to do it, you want to outsource it. Um, it's something that I can do. Um, and uh, and here are some ways of of contacting me. So okay, uh, okay. So I think Thanks. that's that's it. I was just checking the questions in the chat, but I think we can leave them. So I'm going to stop my share now, so I can see you guys again. That's good. Thank you so much yet again, Elizabeth. You're you're a fantastic teacher, coach, so experienced. 
we'll uh, we just love having you on and imparting your knowledge and experience to everyone so thank you so much um one of the things that came to my mind when you were talking about the distribution of the um breakdown between carbohydrates protein and fat and you were saying think fat last is it, of course most people i mean there are exceptions some people do come quite lean but i would say the vast bulk of people come overweight to the race and um, actually the race is a great opportunity to lose weight so we do have this trophy called the biggest loser um, and we actually had a danish a very big danish guy very tall as well who lost a record 30 pounds or was it 13 and a half kilos in 2018 um but i would say very it's very typical for people to lose you know around five kilos or 10 pounds at the race each year so you know people should you know just build that in expect to lose weight um during the race um, and the other thing was, and I, you did touch on it, but I think it's worth emphasizing, is that people sh really should test their food as much in advance as possible because they're not used to rehydrating meals and eating these types of foods on a day-to-day -day basis. So please don't leave it to the last minute, to the last week or two, but you know, try it when they're doing their training runs, do, when they're doing their back-to-back -back long days at the weekends, that's when they should come home and um, you know rehydrate their meals and see how their body reacts to it at that point. Um, so um, you've is Tess is still away. Um, there's some questions uh, coming in about Garth answered about the weight of the food being weighed. Um, question about equipment. Take two sizes larger. Okay, I'll let uh, Garth answer that. Um, let me, at this stage, introduce Fleur from Currents. Fleur, can you hear me? I can. Yep. Hi, Great. everyone. I hope you can hear me. Great. Well, welcome. Thank you for joining us today. And uh, I, I'd like you to, you know, take the floor now and tell us all about Currents. Imagine... Most people here don't know anything about currents. So why don't you uh, tell us the benefits of it? You don't need to sell it to Tess and myself, but let's, um, let me hand it over to you now. Great. Thanks, Colin. Let me just share my screen here and start my presentation. Great. Hopefully you can all see that. Um, let me just move this. My screen, great. Um, so look, thank you very much for having me here today, um, Tess and Colin. Um, so as per their introduction, my name is Fleur Cushman. I'm the founder of Health Currency, the brand owner of Currens, and we are sponsors of the GCG Ultra this year. So in this 10 minute talk, I'm going to share with you how our clinically proven fitness supplement made from black currant bioactives can support your recovery and your GI integrity for the demands of Grand to Grand Ultra. And importantly, it'll help you to better enjoy the whole experience. Um, plus, everyone who has entered in this year's race will have the opportunity to receive a free 30 capsule pack and trial the product. Um, and I'll provide details of that at the end. Uh, so just to kick off and set the scene, Currens um, is used by one of by some of the world's leading ultra runners, including Ruth Croft, pictured here on the slide. Um, Ruth has won uh, UTMB. She's a two-time winner of the Marathon du Mont Blanc um, and also the iconic Western States 100-mile endurance run held in the States in 2022. So what is Currens? Um, so Currens is a maximum strength freeze-dried black currant extract um, in a 300 milligram capsule and it's a highly portable runner's supplement that can be taken on the move and with our international program of research we have unlocked the fitness benefits of New Zealand black currants which are one of the world's most nutrient rich nutrient dense sources of polyphenols We've discovered several powerful and sought after applications for runners and since launching a decade ago, Currens has become a highly trusted supplement used by some of the world's leading endurance, endurance athletes and also uh, sports teams. 
So for races like the Grand to Grand Ultra, Currens has a brilliant advantage in that it delivers some heavyweight benefits, but weighs next to nothing. Um, it's highly portable, convenient, easy to use, and really gentle on the stomach. So let's look at the bioactives that really make this product stand out. Currens isn't a carbohydrate, it isn't a protein, and it isn't a fat. Um, it is made from anthocyanins, which are a flavonoid and are a subclass of a polyphenol. Um, and these are natural bio bioactives found in many fruits and vegetables that we consume. Um, so anthocyanins are actually one of the hottest botanical compounds in the nutraceutical world at present because of their host of functional benefits. Um, they are antioxidants, anti-inflammatories, and vasodilators. So they naturally enhance a host of biochemical and physiological responses in the body. They have adaptogenic properties, which means that they help the body to react, cope, and recover from physical stress. So why New Zealand black currants? Uh, New Zealand black currants actually have one of the highest densities of these bioactives of any fruit growing globally. And this is because of the powerful New Zealand environment and the intensity of our ultraviolet sunlight, which stimulates the pigment in the fruit, which is the anthocyanin. And New Zealand black currants possess concentrations of anthocyanin bioactives that are not present in any other berry. So from this graph, you can see how our New Zealand grown black currants rank by their anthocyanin concentrations compared to other common superfruits used in sports nutrition products. And you can see that New Zealand black currants are world leaders with one and a half times the concentrations of European grown black currants, over twice that of European blueberries, five and a half times of cranberries, and over six times that of cherries. So muscle recovery is one of the product's main benefits. The antioxidants and anti-inflammatory actions prime the body to cope with the effects of physical stress, and they particularly support the body in the secondary phases of recovery. So Currens helps to reduce delayed onset muscle soreness, we've seen in studies, by half. It provides up to three times faster of re uh, recovery three times faster recovery of muscle function after really hard e efforts and damaging exercise. We've seen it decreases muscle tissue damage by 84% and it enhances blood flow, which is really great for tissue repair and for faster clearance of lactate. So Currens really shines for high training demands and multi-day stage races when there are really short periods of recovery between sessions. And the um, runner pictured in the slide is Christian Morgan, who set uh, faster snow on time across the Appalachian Trail last year using Currens. The product provided him with a recovery edge that he needed to secure the record on his fourth attempt. And Currens was run. Uh, Christian was running the equivalent of two full marathons every day for 49 days. So Currens has two very important effects on fueling and energy and muscle metabolism. We've seen that after taking the product for seven days, it really changes the way that the body fuels by enhancing fat oxidation and reducing reliance on carbohydrate, making it a really valuable addition uh, to your performance larder. One week's intake of currents provides fat burning adaptations to fueling that are normally seen after one to three months of endurance training. Obviously, if you can rely more on your body's unlimited fat reserves and lower your reliance on carbohydrate, it reduces fatigue, fatigue factors and leads to enhanced endurance. And also in a race like this, as Elizabeth has um, you know, generously shown throughout her great presentation, you're going to be restricted to calories. So if you can tap into your body's natural energy reserves, it's going to be a really good thing for a race like this. Um, additionally, and specifically to a race like the Grand to Grand Ultra, exercising in the heat leads to, leads to a decline in your body's ability to use fat as fuel. But we have seen in studies that Currens helps to counteract this and increases fat oxidation to an impressive degree in hot conditions. 
So this is a picture uh, in the slide of Hayden Hawks, who is a leading professional US ultra and trail runner who uses currents for its fast recovery and GI support in races like the 100 mile endurance uh, run at Western States. And I'll get on to the GI effects later. So we recently made a major finding about how currents helps to protect runners against the effects of exertional heat stress. And as most of you will likely know, exertional heat stress and runner's trots are a really big problem for ultra runners um, in the heat and it causes stitch, nausea, vomiting and diarrhea. So obviously if your GI integrity falls apart, it will prevent you from taking on nutrition. And if you can't refuel, you can't perform and you will struggle to finish your stages. So as well as nailing your fueling and recovery, recovery during a race like this, holding onto your gut will also be one of the biggest challenges you will face in the G2G Ultra. Um, but fortunately, currents can provide a supporting role here as well. So as well as helping your body's ability to regulate heat, it protects the gut against heat damage and leaky gut, and it will also prime the body to better handle the inevitable heat stress response that you will encounter in hot conditions. So we, for this benefit, we recommend taking the product um, in the week leading up to the event to deliver the heat protective benefits. So in terms of dosing and guidelines, the golden rule in training is to take one to two capsules, one to two hours before exercise. You really want the actives in your bloodstream when you start to exercise. Now for recovery, the currents can just be used on the days you train, but for heavy training blocks and multi-day stage races, use it daily. Now it's really important for races to take two capsules for seven days leading up to the event. Loading will really prime your body um, so that you can really uh, benefit from the full suite of benefits that currents can provide. In the race itself, you can take two capsules up to three times a day. Um, this is our recommended protocol for events like um, uh, uh, multi-day stage racing, Ironman, and also ultra endurance events over eight hours. Um, so we suggest you take it upon rising um, two hours before you start the race, uh, take it during the day as well, and then also before bedtime. Um, using currants, you can have it with or without food. It's very, very gentle on the stomach, um, and it's also very unusual for anyone to have a bowel reaction with the product. We have removed all of the fiber from the fruit just to retain the bioactives. Um, each uh, capsule weighs 300 milligrams. Um, so with 30 capsules, which should be enough to see you through a race like G2G Ultra, it will weigh about nine to 11 grams, including the blister packaging. So in summary, using currents in training and competition will deliver faster recovery between the stages. It will help combat muscle soreness and enhance your fueling and muscle function. It has, it will provide a clinically proven research performance advantage for endurance and it is a tried and tested aid in multi-day stage races. It's also one of the very few supplemental interventions available for protecting the gut against the heat and reducing symptoms of exertional heat stress. So for anyone who customarily experiences GI problems and struggles to hold on to their gut, uh, this should be a really great supporting product for you. Um, as always, we always recommend that you use a product in training, in, in training and don't try anything new in the race itself um, so that you are familiar with using it and you're really confident using it going into the race. Um, so to give everyone an opportunity to try it before the race, um, we recommend using it during your training. And we have everyone, um, we're offering everyone um, a free pack so if you haven't already, please send your um, address details to Tessa and Colin and we can arrange that. Um, additionally, we're also offering everyone a 20% discount on um, follow-up purchases using the discount code G2G Ultra at Currens.com. 
Um, and just really finally as a footnote that Currens has been used with great success in multi-day stage desert races down the years um, with, with many athletes, including uh, last year's six-day Atacama Desert Crossing winner Scotty Hawker, who's pictured here in the slide. Uh, Scotty broke several stage records despite it being held in a heat wave and only three weeks after finishing 15th in the 100k event at UTMB at Chamonix. So uh, feel free to head over to our USA website where we are allowed to make claims and share our research for more information. And that website address is currensusa.com. Um, also, I'm happy to field any questions um, and take emails as well. My um, email is info at um, and I'm happy to speak to people individually as well. Well, thank you very much, Fleur. That was very informative. And, you know, Tess and I have been using the product for the last couple of months. We've noticed that there's been an improvement with our recovery time. Every time we've used it, you know, we take it just before we we expect to do uh, heavy exercise or going out hiking or running and also afterwards. So we, we're definitely sold on it and we're, we'll continue to use it. Um. So let me just open the floor. People have been sending in uh, messages. Thank you. Hopefully we've answered most of those. But now's the time for a Q&A for both Elizabeth and Fleur. So if you've got any questions, please please um, ask your questions now. Either put your hand up or uh, feel free to send a chat message. No questions? That's great. Uh, Orly, yes. Why don't you unmute Orly? Yeah, my, my, I had the first questions at the right beginning of the session. How specific must be the summary of the food be uh, for the um, reg regarding the rules of the race? Right. I'll I'll hand that over to Garth. I think he maybe message you, but Garth, are you able to answer that? What was the question again, please? How sp how detailed and specific must be the, um, the label on the food on what is mostly if we, if we repack it, then we don't have the official label on it. So is it okay if like on each food pack, there's the number of calories and and I don't know what, do we need to put the weight on? Or... Okay. Yes. Um, so um, we it it's for your benefit to have an understanding of the calories that you are taking with you, right? Um, and in your summary sheet that you turn in at the race check-in, you should have that all written out. You know, my... My stage three breakfast has 450 calories, whatever it is. Now, since most people repackage uh, their food and the labels are lost and we are not necessarily versed in every language that is out there uh, I, on the packaging, we weigh the food and from that we get an estimate of how many calories are there. Okay. And so so it's while while it's good to write on it, um, then uh it is the the determining factor is the absolute weight of the food. And we will and that is explained in, in that chart in the equipment section. Okay. <clears throat> Very well. And yeah, I just added later than that what was uh interesting is is to write down the um, amount of water you need to rehydrate it. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Else mm -hmm. you'll have a soup. <laughs> I, I usually have a lot of soup. I'm not good <laughs> at the rehydration, but it's okay.
There was a question right at the very beginning. <clears throat> um, that was when Elizabeth, I guess, showed the um, chart showing 19,000 calories. And the question was, does that include food consumed whilst running, not just breakfast and dinners? I guess it's yes, right? Yeah, <clears throat> that is uh, everything. Everything, yeah. Yeah. Um, I will also say that if you more or less follow what I talked about in the presentation, um, you will probably have about um, in the region of 400 calories per 100 grams, which pre which I think matches up with how you ca like calculate the calories when you weigh the food, right? Mm -hmm. um, there's a few new questions. Uh, do you find it beneficial to have a front fanny pack for access to snacks during the day? Um, so I, so it, uh, I might have mentioned that in the equipment talk, if you go to the equipment talk, but basically there are a few things that you want to have easy access to when you're out on the stage. Your goal should be to not have to take your pack off when you're on a stage the exception is the long stage um where you know i think it's acceptable to take your pack off once or twice to to mm -hmm. just reload a few things from the back to the front so i personally don't use a front pack i find it a bit restrictive mm -hmm. and warm um i try to just um stuff things in pockets like i like to have a pair of shorts with pockets and I like to have some front pockets on my backpack. So it's just that I can reach my things. Um, and if, but if you are a walker, you might need some more storage for your snacks, for example. Um, but yeah, so that, that's what I would say. It's individual uh, preference, but you should have some way of accessing the things you need during a stage without taking your pack off. Uh, somebody asked tips on post race slash post event nutrition in the days following the race things to do slash avoid. Um, so here you're coming out in, you know, your body has been through a quite extreme event. You might have lost several kilos because you will have been in several thousand calories deficit, um, per day. You'll probably be fatigued, um. Some people bounce back really quickly. I know people who they don't run for months after, <laughs> mm. right? And and they are tired for weeks. And some people bounce back immediately. It's very individual, but I would say just you know nourish your body and and focus on really um, nutrient rich foods. You want to eat well, you know, fruit vegetables, clean foods. It's going to be very tempting to just stuff every hamburger and pizza you see. But I think, you know, try to stay a bit um, healthy and get yeah. plenty of sleep. <clears throat> and and like Fleur pointed out, mm -hmm. uh, you know, that the, the current product reduces oxidative stress and inflammation yeah you're probably going to have quite high inflammation after what you've done and so anything that mm -hmm. can help you reduce that is is going to be probably helpful steve has asked a good question about is a 20 liter pack big enough to hold everything we need and garth says 20 to 24 liters is typically large enough the danger if you go to a 30 liter pack steve is that you'll want to fill it up and you'll end up getting more weight. So that's why this year, for the first time, we've restricted the, the weight to 12 kilos because we've had people just take way too much stuff for them and take way too much food. And that has really um, scuppered their race within the first couple of days. So as David e., as Davide mentioned, you know, don't be worried about taking too little food. The problem for most people who fail is they're carrying just way too much weight. They're carrying non-mandatory stuff and way too much food. And that's usually the problem. So mm -hmm. the smaller the pack you've got is usually a correlation for the success in the race. 
and, and what you can do is strap your, you know, if you can't fit everything in, strap uh, your sleeping bag mm -hmm. on the on the outside for two days, right? And so mm -hmm. if your sleeping bag is, is in a stuff sack that is kind of round and you don't really know how to strap it, you buy uh, one of these uh, slightly longer um, dry, lightweight dry bags. Mm -hmm. um, and then you stuff your sleeping bag in that and it's much easier to strap onto your backpack because it's longer, mm -hmm. it's going to stay on. You just strap that on the top or the bottom or, or you know, wherever it fits. And then mm -hmm. after two days, you've eaten enough food to put that sleeping bag inside your pack. <clears throat> Anna is asking, is 12 kilograms including water? No, that's without water. <clears throat> so mandatory amount of water would be at least 1.5 liters. We recommend that you have a 750 mil bottle times two. So that's 1.5 liters that you'll carry um, in addition to 12 kilograms. If anybody has a pack weight of 12 kilos in August, call me for a consultation, please. <laughs> and I'll, I'll take like, I take two, three kilos away from that. Three. <laughs> yeah. It's going to be worth it. I'll save your race. There is the question again about uh, how the, f the transporting the foods um, over the borders in, in the plane. I think Tess, last time you sent us the yeah, a link, a link from the government, yeah. and you said that yeah. it was. So I should have the link somewhere. Yeah, uh, basically, just just take everything as it is. You can you can unpack, uh, and repackage in repack once we're in Canab. Yes. And, yeah. Yeah, that would be best. Yeah. And you've never had any problem with that. No one mm -hmm. has mm -mm. ever been in no. trouble with. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, let me find that link again. It's it's basically because the 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 um, <clears throat> um the customs um authority actually periodically um. Yeah, I have it too. It's, it's, yeah. Where... Hang on. <clears throat> I think it says what can I what food I think I posted it up just now uh-huh thank you yes oh here we go bringing food into the U.S. Is that what you shared, Garth? U.S. Customs and Border Protection. Yeah, from TSA. Mm -hmm. Not from from Customs, but from TSA. All right, All right. Okay, maybe I can share this as well, just for addition. This is the CVP. So um, here it is. <clears throat> there you go. And can we, should we have it in the, um, in our carry-on or in our luggage? I, I don't think we can oh. have it all in the carry-on. If yeah. we have the sleeping bag, the, the, the sleeping mat, all the. You're carrying that. Yeah. Because those could, are essential. I don't think we can have all the food not repacked in the carry-on. Okay. So if we. The only it's, risk is losing the suitcase, but mm -hmm. I well, the thing about losing food, if you if you check in your food and you you your luggage gets somehow lost or delayed, the good news is you can replace it because you could get food in Kanab, I guess. So, if I were to hand carry stuff, it would be the more essential things that would be hard to replace, like your your. Where I, I yeah. usually I used to wear my shoes or my running shoes that I'm going to run with. I I either wear it or carry it with me. 
um, your backpack that you're going to run with. Um, your jacket, your sleeping bag. So those are essentials. Um, yeah, I would, I mean, I would, I would just check in my, my food, unless you have, you have room okay, to carry on for your hand carry. Yeah. For your onboard luggage. Uh, the name of the tape people use to avoid um, strap chafing. Um, you can use either rock tape. Our um, medical director likes to use rock tape. That's um, or um, kinesio tape is also good. KT tape, same thing. Yeah. KT, yeah. KT tape, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, free stride food may be okay in cabin luggage. I would, I would think so. And that video says gorilla tape. Yeah. So let's see. Um. Okay. Um, okay, another message. <clears throat> okay. Any other questions? Um, nothing else? Okay. Well, I think we'll... Uh... <clears throat> Bring it to a close then. Um, I believe our next Zoom meetup will be featuring our medical director. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it, we've, I can't remember the date, I but think, it's sometime it's in the middle of July. 17th, 17th July, but I'll have to mm -hmm. confirm. Oh, when, when? Sorry. When is that? <clears throat> 17th July. <clears throat> yeah, we'll, we'll send out a, an email and it'll be posted on social media as well. The, the exact details of the meeting time. Mm -hmm. uh, but it'll be good timing because you will all be <clears> thinking <throat> about your uh, medical form and he'll go through the mm -hmm. do's and don'ts for you to get to the start line injury free <clears throat> and also um, how to look after yourselves uh, during the week, particularly on foot care and what the backup uh, will be there from the, the medical team. We have all these uh, qualified me emergency medical doctors who are participating and um, who are uh, experts in wilderness medicine as well. So we're, we have a great mm -hmm. medical team. So he'll be talking about that. Um, um, for those of you running, um, I hope you have seen the email about the medical form that you can now download and hopefully you've now booked your appointment so just remember that the appointment needs to be between um the 22nd of july and 22nd of august and send dr josh a copy um and to me as well and you don't need to bring the original to canab um dr josh will will have copies so just just remember um, I know sometimes it takes time to to book an appointment with um, with your doctor. Um, oh, okay. One more message. Oh, yes. You're welcome, Connie. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Um, so <clears throat> great seeing you again. Another great Zoom meetup. Thank you yeah. again, Elizabeth, for such. Um, a fantastic presentation, great information. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Elizabeth, uh, and thank you, Fleur. Oh, now, now you're showing off. And <laughs> Fleur, can you can we see your hearts as well? Okay. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Fleur. Thank you, everyone. Have a great uh, have a great day and, and evening, and we'll see yeah. you on the next Zoom. Thanks. Until the next time. Thank, thank, you. thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye.
Bye. Bye